I have good news and I have bad news. I'm just going to poll the room. Which one do you guys want to hear first? Raise your hand for the good news. All right, one for the good news. Uh, who wants the bad news? All right, there's one, two, three. Just want to make sure we get an accurate That's count awesome. here. Four, five, six, seven. Okay, so uh, the bad news is I am hideously unprepared for this talk. <laughs> but the good news is that, uh, well, there actually isn't any good news. That's part of the bad news. But I am a good improviser, so I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, so I wanted to give, or uh, at least I, I wanted to get the chance to tell people about a lot of aspects of operating systems that I thought were really useful to know that I never got to hear about when I was in uh, undergrad at all. So uh, I'm going to tell you those things. For a little bit of background on myself, you can go on davidawad.com which you should definitely go on anyway because it's a great website. I very rarely post on my blog, but you should go there. Uh, one other thing you should see, uh, not just in the About section, but uh, you can go on Publications and you can find my book. And later on, I will post the links to the lecture slides on here at some point. But for now, they are on, the, uh, they're on this Facebook page. And so what we're going to do is as we go, I'm going to pull up a lot of different resources and references that I think are valuable to look at. Uh, some of them I won't be able to share on the site because it would be a violation of the Georgia Tech Honor Code. But most of it I can share publicly without any problems. So, uh, yeah, before I jump in, I wrote out a bunch of topics here that I think are worth touching on in various levels of detail. But I want to pull the room to, uh, <clears throat> to get a sense of if there are other topics or just random things about an operating system you've wanted to know about or things about computers that you feel like you don't know. I will say I have touched upon every single thing about computing with the exception of, uh, with the exception of building graphics cards and iOS development. So like anything, any other thing you could think of, I've probably at the very least Google searched at least once. Anything. Dual booting? Dual I actually do want to talk about the dual proce uh, the boot process, but I'll add dual booting on here. Hopefully, we can get to it. Uh, but do, do, do. Okay. Uh, so I wasn't expecting anyone to have some random burning question that they were going to slap the table, stand up, and shout to the heavens. But uh, you know, obviously, I'm sure these things will come up as we go. So you can send them to me. Uh, you can send them to me as a Facebook message or something like that. Uh, actually, you know what might be good. Uh, I'm debating whether to set up a Google Slides. We probably won't need it. If you have questions, just raise your hands. So uh, I want to start with the history of Linux. So uh, it's time to go back to the 90s, or maybe even further back than that, depending on how hardcore you want to get about this. So uh, how many of you know how Linux came to be? Good, so this is going to be valuable to a certain extent. All right, so we, to start with Linux, we, have to, we actually have to go back even further than that. So I'm going to pull up a page. The Wikipedia page on operating systems should get us there. Or at the very least, something about the history of Linux. Because Linux was not the, obviously Linux was not always the behemoth it was today. Originally, software used to be done very, very differently. It used to be that, um, well, let's see here. I'm looking for a particular diagram that I know is really good for this. Linux was not the first operating system, like I said. The very, some of the first ones were uh, OG versions of operating systems first built by hardcore electrical engineers at Bell Labs in Homedale, which you guys have probably heard of plenty of times. Those guys never shut up about how Bell Labs used to be there, and now nothing is there. Sad life. Items is there. Items is there? <laughs> so, like, nothing is there. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you, you know, they, they don't have... Uh, they don't have nearly as much of a claim to fame now as they did then. I really wish I could find the image I'm looking for, but basically, ah, there we go. I think this is, nope, not the one, not the one. Mm -hmm. It starts out with something called Multix, which was the first multi-user computer system, and it later turned into I think this is the one I wanted. Come on. Oh my god, it's just a series of, all right, great. There we go. The PDP-7. This is the image I was looking for. Uh, so computing actually starts out with the wild PDP-7 built at Bell Labs, which eventually turns into Unix, 
The Unix versions 1 and 4 are built pretty much exclusively inside of AT&T. It spins out into two different versions based on different goals of the engineers using it for different things. Eventually, uh, the University of Berkeley, California, decides that they have different ideas for what they want Unix to be able to do. They create a fork of it called the Berkeley Software Distribution. That's what BSD stands for. They end up uh, developing more and more versions of it. Uh, Unix version 7 starts spinning off into uh, its final stages here. And BSD gets forked into Sun. Uh, I don't want to step through every single part of this because some of it's useful, some of it's not, but there are a few acronyms you may have seen before. So, for example, the, uh, the researchers that split off Unix versions 1 through 4 end up building something called System 5, which is now seen as one of the old school ways to do a lot of system calls in C programming. So, for example, if you've heard of the difference between like the POSIX version of a system call and the System 5 version of a system call, these are the guys who were responsible for that. System 5 was one, of the first, uh, was one of the first operating systems designed to make it really straightforward to come up with a set of, uh, like, I, I guess these guys basically won the popularity battle, you could say, for who could make the most straightforward system calls. So when these guys started building all of their stuff, they got super popular. Their libraries started getting ported to machine after machine, and they ended up sort of owning the market for how to semantically think of system calls in the programmer mindshare until POSIX comes out much later and, and sort of throws all that under the water. There's something else that I should have mentioned and should have started with before we can even get into any of this, which brings us back up here. Uh, yeah, like I said, improvising. So before we can even talk about why some of these things are as impressive as they are, is that we should first talk about computing in and of itself, right? When people first started writing programs, what they were doing was writing instructions specifically to manipulate bits on transistors on a processor. Let's take a step back, right? Computing, before any of this nonsense happens, is... Think of a good assembly language image to print out. All right, forget it. When you write a program, what you are doing is solely manipulating zeros and ones. The beginning of the process is quite literally transistors that either are or are not conducting electricity, right? A processor has a set of pins on it that determine when electricity is signaling on those pins, that those pins are hardwired so that electricity will flow, those electrons will go through specialized gates that are built to reproduce logical functions. Hopefully, not, th is any of this news to you guys? You've all probably heard this in computer architecture. Hopefully, hopefully, great. So. What you're doing, or what people were doing when they were first writing assembly code, was you would look, you would build a particular processor, or you'd be using a certain kind of processor. You would know the processor has pins A, B, and C, and D, maybe, for computation. You could use those four registers to do math, to do division, multiplication, etc. And so the processor had certain pins that supported certain logical gates that did certain operations. If anyone ever tells you about something called the TI-84 data book, that was a book you could use to look through Texas Instruments' entire arsenal of chips you could buy to do certain operations. And what you would do is you would buy the chips, you would take them to a breadboard, and you would put them in and wire them together to get, your com to get certain computation to happen. Once people started making general purpose multiprocessors, I shouldn't use the word multiprocessor here yet, I will say uniprocessors, what they were doing was saying, I have four registers and I want to dynamically define what these are going to be used for. So they started writing out based on specifications of which pins are attached to which gates, what computation will happen. Let me pull up something on risk that is also, I'm going to add that here, risk and basics of computing. I will fill this with links, I promise. If it just ends up with me talking for a while, tell me to shut up and I'll look up stuff to throw in there. Images, blah, blah. What is a good one to use? Coming up with visual aids on the fly is an awesome activity, guys. I don't want to talk about CISC. What the heck is that? Oh, my God. Google Images is a journey, everyone. Uh, okay, not great, whatever, okay. So, 
you have these general purpose processors that are being built. Everyone's writing these programs that are specific to the processor. You get your processor and you get this fancy book that says on every page what each instruction does and how it modifies certain registers inside the processor. So this is useful, right? We're like 1970 right now. Maybe like basically 1970s. What you can do with this is you can write programs that are useful for a specific processor, but what you cannot do is say, hey, friend who, who's from California using an IBM 8080 when I'm on my IBM 6060, try out this program I wrote to factor an integer. You could not do this. Because if you sent someone your program, assuming Ethernet was a thing at the time, I don't know the year off the top of my head. If you sent someone your program, they could, run, they could take it and try to run it but it wouldn't work. Why wouldn't it work? You can't answer. You know the answer. Okay, fine. You can answer. Uh, different instruction set? Exactly. The instruction set defined which pins that guide I was telling you about before. You, get, you would get this guide that basically said, here's each instruction that the CPU supports. And so this instruction will do these things. It, and what would happen is certain CPUs would have way more instructions than others, right? There were, it would get to the point where there were certain CPUs that were coming out that gave you the ability to like calculate the nth root of a number or something like that. There were ones that would let you factor a polynomial on the processor pins, which is ridiculous, which is where this acronym that you may have seen before comes from. Uh, a pretty famous dude whose name is not coming to my mind, but of risk. John Koch, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Architecture. When all these processors started coming out that were supporting all these crazy features, it got really difficult for people to be able to share their programs from one place to another. So there were two ways to attack this problem. RISC was the first, C was the second. RISC was the concept of creating a reduced instruction set arch architecture that was mostly standard and didn't contain anything you didn't need. Nobody needed, a pro, nobody needed a CPU instruction that could calculate a polynomial. It, it made more sense for you to compute that at, the, at a higher level of abstraction than it would to write out your CPU instructions by hand or call the specific factorial instruction because you also don't know what that factorial function does under the hood. The only advantage you'd have is that it was running at the CPU so it would be as fast as possible, right? And this will be a uh, constant computing paradigm you'll see come up over and over again. What level of abstraction are we interested in operating at? And how useful is it for us to operate at that level of abstraction? Is this making sense? I totally realized that I should have talked about, uh, I should have written these things in my uh, Google Docs slide. So uh, for a little bit of context, this guy now works at Google working on TensorFlow enabled machines, like building hardware enabled machine learning devices because the closer you are to the CPU, the faster all of your instructions will be. So if you can write things that translate TensorFlow models into CP, direct CPU instructions, you can run them straight on the hardware and they'll be way faster. So he created RISC, great guy. That's pretty much the most exciting thing he ever did and then he sort of faded into obscurity for like 30 years. I think he is at Berkeley now? I'm not entirely sure. but. RISC was the first means of solving a two-pronged problem. RISC asserted we need to create a more, gener a, a more general instruction set that we can use as a standard on all of our processors, after which we can then operate at higher levels of abstraction and create more portable programs. Now, there's still some things that exist with this that needed to be solved, right? If I wrote a program and I wanted somebody else to share it, they, they could only run it if they had the same exact processor, but they could also see all of the code. Because you couldn't, you couldn't obstruct or obfuscate your assembly because an assembly file, I'm sure you've seen them, hopefully, an assembly file looks kind of like this. Assembly example, actually, let me pull up a great example because I'm going to end up going to this anyway. Uh, why is that name not coming to me? Intermezos. So Intermezos is a really good book on operating systems that I highly recommend you guys look at when you get a chance. For now, we're just going to jump into the first edition and multi the multi-boot header section.
just because I want to show you guys a little bit more about what assembly looks like. Let's go there. Yeah, so assembly, mm, I'm not finding the thing. There we go. That'll work. So assembly instructions are somewhat straightforward. They say move concept key value, usually. Now, we can talk more about what this particular thing is doing in a little bit. But what I'm trying to show you here is that uh, almost all of the assembly instructions are very straightforward. You had a routine name, and you had the instruction itself. You could specify, say, add this register, that register, move this register to that register, divide, etc. There was a particular register that had the output of certain computations. So if you did something like a compile, a compare, the output would be set inside of a certain flag on the processor, right? So we generalized all of these through risk, but we could still see each other's programs and we shared them, which brings us to C, right? So the C programming language, which most of you have probably heard of, let me pull that up. C programming language, everyone's favorite. So this is a great book that almost all of you should buy. Uh, the C programming language was the first general purpose programming language to be picked up. It's considered a high level language because it is easily human readable. That standard is different depending on who you talk to. Some people believe assembly is easily human readable, but those people are less fun to hang out with than on average. Like that's statistically proven. So the C was written by two people from Bell Labs, Brian Kernigan and Dennis Ritchie. Kernigan is actually a professor at Princeton. You can go to his office hours and ask him to sign your books, which is pretty cool. So uh, what's so special about C? The first thing that C gave you was the following, right? We're moving one level of abstraction higher up our computing hierarchy, right? Before it was, I have instructions for a processor. I'm going to send them to somebody I know. They can take my assembly program and run it. Great, assuming it runs on their processor. C adopted a different paradigm. C said, let's use an intermediate language that humans can easily understand where I will take my code in human readable format and compile it, create some sort of tool that will translate my high level concepts into low level concepts. Where it gets even more useful is now I can take my C program and compile it for a particular processor so that the same program can be used on one processor or another. But there's one last aspect to this, which is the concept of the object file. I don't want to get too far into how machine code happens because it's a little bit of a miasma that I don't want to get into. But you basically got the ability to write C code that could be shared from person to person and compiled on that person's machine for a particular processor. And then it could be directly run, which was really, really, really nice. Next movement in operating systems. Java is what I'm going to jump to. How many of you hate Java? Good, great, OK. So uh, one of the first things you'll notice, uh, actually, Java was built to solve a particular problem that was weird about C, which was that it shouldn't, basically, people wanted to have virtual machines that you could run linked compiled objects on that were more easily portable than object files that were compiled for a particular object uh, architecture. I may have skipped a step in there, but are you all following so far? Right, you want to just run everywhere. Exactly. That's where we're going. The problem with C was that you compiled it on any machine, and it ran on the machine slash processor pair that it was compiled for. Java got you the next level of abstraction up on this paradigm, which was, I have a program. I want to run it, but I don't want to bother with downloading the version for a specific operating system. If somebody wanted to give me a program, but they didn't want to give me the source code, they had to compile it for my processor and operating system and send it to me in a particular executable binary format that worked for me. Uh, actually, maybe we should talk about that a little bit. How many of you have ever heard of ELF? You're killing it, man. I love it. So ELF is one of many executable file, file formats. ELF stands for the executable linker format. This is the most, uh, I will call it the most common, but someone could uh, shoot me for saying that. I will call it the most commonly used within Linux form of an executable file. So before I described to you this paradigm of people sharing their C code, you could compile it, you get out something called an ELF file, let's say, or you get out of that a file that you can run on your particular computer. You run that file on your particular computer. If you send that ELF file to somebody else running Windows, 
it's not going to do anything. It'll fail completely and probably be rejected because Windows will catch it before it ever gets run on anything. Because once, once that program runs, what it does inside of the operating system is anyone's game. Or inside of your computer's internals is anyone's game. So let me pull that up. I think we're going to end up with a series of links that you guys should definitely look through after this. So ELF, yeah. Uh, 1999, chosen as the standard binary file format for Unix and Unix-like systems. Cool. OK. So we're compiling our C programs. We're turning them into ELFs that are machine-specific. But I don't want to deal with machine specificity. I want to write a program once and be able to send it to anyone, and I shouldn't have to give them the source code for them to be able to compile it themselves. This is how we get to Java. Java was not the only language that came out to solve this problem, but it just happens to be the one that caught on the most, and open source started becoming pretty fancy and loved at the time. So, yeah, so it happened. And so people started writing Java. Java introduced a critical concept called the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. The idea was that they would publish out a program that was a layer of abstraction in between the compiled Java code and the actual pro code that was running on the machine. This layer of abstraction would say, you give us compiled Java code. This is not an ELF. This is a Java-specific format that you can stick basically like sticking an 8-track into a Betamax. Do any of you know what that means? Cool, never mind. Uh, like sticking a VHS into a tape player? Does any of you know what that means? OK, great. I'm only 24.7. This shouldn't be that. All right. So you could stick your compiled Java.o files, or sorry, .class files, into any JVM. And you and the whole point of the project was you were guaranteed this would work. There were also a lot of other really powerful paradigms that Java introduced, such as like Java was the first language, I think, to get methods and classes really right. C didn't really have any notion of classes. The closest it had were structs, which we should also probably talk about before we get too far up this. Uh, who has a definition of what a struct is that you think would be helpful? I mean, it's like an object, but without methods. Right. That's sure. A, that's a vague. Yes, that is a vague answer, but it's good. So Java was cool because it comes out with classes. There are large bundles of data. One thing that I should have expounded upon a little bit earlier when I started talking about zeros and ones, how we get from zeros and ones to assembly to C, one of the most valuable things about this is how groups of bits are treated, right? A single bit being a transistor that's either zero or one. And all that C says, C is not doing anything magical, right? C is giving you convenient abstractions on top of the electricity, where you have a character, right? A group of eight bits that allow you to identify a particular that you simply treat as a particular integer that you're going to treat as meaning a specific thing, right? Because uh, a character is actually just an integer that corresponds to a particular table of symbols. You've probably heard of this, ASCII, right? The ASCII table is a great thing to look at if you have no life. Uh, it tells you basically what every single integer corresponds to, 8-bit, uh, right? 2 to the 8 minus 1. one or, uh, whoops, sorry, 120, my, my mind is all over MapReduce, so forgive me if I get silly. So you had one byte, 8 bits, to represent any given character, and all C is telling you is if you tell me that you're operating on a character, I'm going to treat it like a character, which means that when you print it and you tell me it's a character, I'm going to look at the integer value there, I'm going to look at that 8 bits at the start of the address you give me, and I'm going to take those 8, I'm going to interpret them as an int, and I'm going to print them out as the character that they correspond to via either the ASCII table or if you're using other programming languages, you'll deal with other character encodings that came out later to support things like those problematic French characters and Japanese characters uh, that become so difficult to print and deal with, especially in C programs. Or if you've ever tried to write Python programs for Arabic, you'll, you'll come up against fun problems too. So every single concept in C that you think is more hardcore than it is, is actually just a convenient labeling on a set of data. When you define a character or an int, those are simply, you can think of them as groups of transistors with particular addresses. And that is all a struct is. A struct is a, a custom type 
that says, I have a character, I have another character, I have an int. So that means I have an eight, an eight, and a four, or sorry, uh, an eight bit, an eight bit, and a four byte, a, a 32 bit uh, custom type that is this size, which is why whenever you create them, you always say, hey, see, give me the address of a block of memory that contains this size of data and you pass the size of your struct, right? Is this sounding familiar? Cool, great. So you do this, you're able to create custom types and I think that was the only gap that I wanted to cover before jumping back up to Java. Are we still good? Does anyone have questions? What is a linked object file? A what? Oh, uh, an executable linked object file. So this is the file you get back where is, where, did I close the tab on ELF? Oh my gosh. I did? Ah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so uh, this is one of many formats that was meant to be interpreted by the operating system that's running it such that it looks at things like, well, the first thing it does is it looks at the bytes at the beginning of the file to see, okay, this is an ELF file. It then finds the memory addresses of the libraries that are linked to it. Let me give you an example of a, let me pull up. Can you guys see? No, I don't want to use that. I'm just looking for like a random file I might have laying around that might be helpful here. Okay. Uh, standard live.h, right? When you write a program, let's say you write a C program and you want it to be able to print, right? You want it to be able to print to the console. So you include something like standard lib .h. What this says to your compiler, your compiler says, oh, I see you want to include something from the standard library. This is just a file that exists on your computer. The compiler knows that it is probably in a place called user slash lib slash include. The compiler says, oh, you want to include some weird .h file, where .h, for those of you who aren't C programmers, just means a header file that defines a bunch of functions that exist that will be usable if this file is included, right? If you include this .h file, you're telling, you run the compiler, the compiler looks through your code because it wants to create that executable and it links your executable by modifying your, uh, by modifying your, <clears throat> modifying your file's headers to say, I'm using this binary, I'm using this library for this thing, Right, include standard lib.h, include, uh, what's a good example? I don't like this because this is C++, which is evil. But uh, threadpool.h is another one that's up there, right? Like anything that you wanted to use, you're telling the compiler, hey, look for these files and mark in the executable that comes out that I want these files to be included in the process when it is run. And I can tell you guys more about how that happens if you are interested. That is the basic answer to your question. I could get you more specifics on ELF format specifically, but I don't, I've never had to delve that far into it. But the basic, the basic concept I think worth taking away when it comes to an ELF is that it defines some of the other parts of your process that you're not writing. Right, like you write your code, but then these other sections of the process, the dot text, the dot data, the static information that needs to exist for your process to know what those functions are that you didn't write, uh, that all exists inside of the header and different executable formats specify how those functions and, and uh, files are gonna be found. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you guys? Cool, okay. So, we know how our programs generally have evolved, at least a little bit, right? We start with this notion of transistors with addresses, a character or any data type being a group of transistors that we're gonna treat with particular semantics. We work from that towards wanting to write in a more convenient programming language to compile and share with other people to compile themselves. Then we move from there to write my code, it can be compiled on any Java-enabled machine, as an example, and then run on any other Java-enabled machine, which, is, which enables private industry to start writing and shipping code that they don't have to give away to people, and they don't have to distribute massive numbers of binaries for every single different uh, computer type. For example, 
that it was not that long ago that if you wanted to download something like, uh, I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but if you wanted to download something that you found out about like BSD, you might have to download a BSD extension specifically for the IBM 6060 running version X of BSD or what have you. But the really powerful thing about some of these higher level languages is that now you just write your code once and anyone can compile it anywhere. And in the world of open source, you can keep building more and more powerful abstractions on top of that. So yeah, we get to Java, right? And we have an actually exciting development because people start doing object orientation. They start creating dynamic and dynamically composing really radically different data types as they go. Then some other new languages get built that take this idea even further. Things like Python come out that are really convenient and really fast. And this is where you get to one of the most, uh, one of these big, this is one of those kind of interview questions. But the reason languages like Python and Ruby are so easy to write with and fast to write with is because these languages are actually implemented in C in Python's case and C++ in Ruby's case. And what you're doing when you do like a list comprehension in Python or you do, you make like a variable and you just say F equals some massive array like I for I in range zero to 100. And you can get the first 100 squares in five seconds because what's happening on the inside is Python is manipulating C structures that are just being very carefully crafted to meet the semantics that you're actually defining with Python. You dropped your uh, breadstick. So if we're all on the same page about that, I'm going to tell you guys a bunch of random facts about operating systems and C and a little bit about some security stuff. But what sounds most interesting? What do you guys think? Any questions or is this all making sense? If it's all making sense, that's shocking. Okay, cool. Great. What the heck did I have here first? Uh, oh, right. History of Linux. How did I forget? Okay, so people start writing Java. Open source starts becoming a thing. In the, when was Linux published? I don't remember off the top. 1992. Okay. So this guy named Linus Torvalds goes on some Swedish forum and starts talking about this operating system that he's been making because he doesn't want to pay for... I don't remember, it was something he didn't want to pay for. So he goes and he starts making his, his own operating system. He starts publishing it out and people start getting really excited about it and they start contributing to it. This is the same guy who built Git. So this dude was a baller, right? He, he actually built Git in response to the massive amount of contributions he was getting on Linux. He built a system that would track the changes so that he wouldn't have such a difficult time with it anymore. Uh, so if any of you have ever heard of Git, you have the same guy to thank for that. He starts, t he starts really getting, gaining a lot of steam, getting some popularity, and a few pretty interesting people take notice of what's happening here. One of them being a guy named Richard Stallman. Any of you ever heard of this cat before? Cool. So Richard Stallman is a pretty interesting dude uh, for lots and lots of reasons. I highly recommend you go on his personal page. Uh, if I remember right, he still has a bunch of wild stuff. <laughs> Uh, he has like a bunch of things about why each company is evil. Like Amtrak is evil? That's wild. All right, anyway. So I have some philosophical disagreements with Richard Stallman about a few things, but Richard Stallman was a guy at MIT who starts seeing these movements happen with open source. So he realizes he wants to take this idea to its logical extreme. He's sick of going down to the, equi the software equivalent of Radio Shack and buying a compiler for OWL. He wants to write his own programs be able to give those programs out to anyone and have anyone be able to give all of their programs to anybody and be able to audit and view all of the code that runs on your computer yourself. All of it. Which is really, really interesting. So he starts working on this concept. He starts writing out, he along with a few other people started working on what would eventually become the GNU project and the C standard library. So almost any of the tools Let's see, uh, what are the, I kind of want to look up what the GNU shell tools that are, the core utils, yeah. They end up putting out something called the GNU core utilities, uh, 
which is a bunch of programs you've probably used, a lot of really useful ones. Some of the basics like ls, which is short for list, make directory, mv, rmdir, sync, shred, commit, expand. These are all shell tools that were built mostly using the C standard library and then eventually ported into Linux. So what, what some people like to say, excuse me, is that Linux is actually or properly should be called GNU plus Linux because it is a series of incredibly useful shell utilities that enabled a lot of progressively better and better C development to happen and uh, a lot of tools on top of just Linux, which is the kernel of the operating system, and enables lots and lots of user space features and system calls and things like that. So at which point, I guess we have to break down what really an operating system is. We've talked a lot about how you can build a, how you can build an operating system using compilable programs. So the notion of what an operating system is, I guess, has to be defined. So um, an operating system at its core is a layer of abstraction between the user space and the physical hardware, right? The idea here being, I should not need to know any assembly to be able to open Google Chrome, right? When someone opens Chrome and they go on a website, they're operating at a really useful level of abstraction. They can use a computer without knowing anything about how it actually works, right? But internally, there are all these fun articles about everything that happens when you type in www.google.com, right? And what those articles are describing to you is the massive, uh, the massive tunnel of abstraction you're going through. The one that I want to talk about that's helpful for us is what the, op what the operating system gets you as far as usefulness. Because originally, people would write out their C programs and run them directly on, uh, at the super user level of permission. And if your program crashed, it took down your computer, which was pretty awesome. So, oh, hey, I'm 24.8. Who knew? OK. Let's see, good. I'm going to pull up a computer architecture diagram. Hopefully, that'll get me where I want to go. Maybe not. Am I allowed to use the whiteboard? Will that affect you on your camera? Sweet. I will now translate to my left. Great. So. Wild. All right. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about what your computer is doing under the hood a little bit more. User space. We can get into this a little bit more as well uh, and talk about how Docker fits into this picture for those of you who have heard of that and other really cool virtualization platforms like that. Why not? We'll get into it. I'll write a little note for myself. Docker and VMware. So, um, oh man, there's so much to talk about with just these things. Okay, so the last piece of this is the hardware. This is the piece we started with, right? You start out with, elect with what are functionally electrical instructions that are manipulating bits or groups of bits inside of transistors that exist on memory, right? So we'll, why not, we can draw this out, mem, CPU, et cetera. I only really care about those two. You'll find if you ever study operating systems that the only things people really care about are how you handle memory and how, like, what kinds of protections you give them against other processes. And lastly, what, uh, how secure, or sorry, what kind of protections you give them against other processes, and how can you extend the kernel? So we'll talk about why Linux became so popular, but let's start by writing out those goals, right? So the goal of an OS is modularity slash extensibility. My handwriting is terrible. I apologize for that. Uh, performance and... Oh my God, why is my train of thought all over the place, guys? Am I high? I have no idea. Remind me never to become a college lecturer because I don't think you're allowed to say those things. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so your goals are extensibility, performance, and security, right? 
For example, if I'm running Google Chrome and I open a tab that has some bad JavaScript that wants to mine a shitcoin on my machine, that should not be able to take down my computer, right? So the operating system actually protects you from this. The operating system protects your, sh protects your, like, your term paper from shitcoin, which is very valuable, right? So we started here. You have your memory, your groups, your blocks, etc. The kernel is just a layer of intermediation that handles each of these goals and enables user level processes mediated by the particular operating system to interact with those resources. So we can get more precise about what we mean by each of these things. So what the kernel does is it creates mechanisms. Oh my God. Uh, the kernel creates mechanisms for you to deal with hardware abstractions that you're interested in. So operating systems are built using these mechanisms and operating systems, you could roughly say, to find policies for how those resources will be used. The kernel maintains its own policies, and we can talk about those in a second, but you could roughly imagine that the operating system uses the resources and mechanisms defined and given to it by the kernel to provide a particular experience to user level processes and programs. So you have some user level, you have some user level programs such as Chrome, Firefox, maybe uh, your current 111 assignment. They all in the eyes of the operating system slash the kernel are equivalent. At this point, it'd probably be helpful to break down what a process is. So let me pull up a good diagram on that. Oh. Uh, this is one that I can actually attest to knowing exactly where the image I want is because I wrote it myself. Pull that up, and I'm also going to pull up this. Wow, that's really wild that that PDF totally failed to. Oh my gosh. What is happening? Oh, okay, cool. All right. So this is a rough diagram of what the operating system is doing when it runs a process. And this will take us back a little bit to some of our conversation from earlier as well. So you have a process containing the following. Our ELF format defines a lot of really useful information about what kinds of binary and image instructions are going to exist for the particular operating system we're going to run our process on. There's a data segment and a BSS segment. This defines some of the static data that your, pro that your process is going to use as defined by the operating system. Let's say you write a program that defines a bunch of global variables. Your compiler can generate a bunch of useful information about that and stick it inside of the BSS segment. You have the stack and the heap, which are just different regions of address space. And then you have inside of your process some shared libraries and whatnot. So your process runs, it is only one piece of a massive pie that is your operating system's entire set of memory. You have the OS, its own processes and mechanisms and the memory it needs, right? If you've ever run, if you've ever looked at your phone and looked at how much memory you have and seen that you bought a 16 gigabyte phone but you only have 14 gigs left, that's because the operating system reserves a certain amount of space that it needs for its own tools and information so that it can better serve you, its master. At least, allegedly, that's how it works. So uh, inside of user space, you have all of your processes and their own memory. So like process 13 could be Google Chrome, process N could be your 111 assignment, like I've drawn out over there. Each of your processes is running and fighting for time on the CPU as the operating system switches out which process is going to run at any given time. So between Chrome and Firefox, your kernel is protecting them from attacking each other. Each of them is given on a certain schedule, and you can customize this in Linux, how, uh, how certain processes are running at which times. And you can write your own custom programs that use the mechanisms provided by the kernel slash operating system to get access to resources. There's, these are a lot of system calls that you may have heard of, right? Schmaget. Um, how many of you have ever used a POSIX message queue? Okay, cool. So you should all look up what a POSIX message queue is because that is something that the operating system gives you, at least in Linux. Uh, 
you can create all kinds of really useful things like shared semaphores. I just realized how much information I'm going to have to cover in the next 14 minutes. Okay. I'm, I'm all over the place. But how many of you are still following me here? How many of you are understanding the narrative I'm trying to build here on how we get from bits to Chrome? So what, que what questions do you, ha do you guys have? Is there like a... Because there is a lot of detail in between here that we are not really able to fully expound upon because it'll take you a while. But I want to sort of give you a general trend so you can understand the ideas of the different abstractions that you're using when you use a computer. Does that make sense? So any questions? What's up? Can you like define kernel? I'm still unclear. Sure. The kernel is the layer of abstraction that mediates software access to hardware resources which is to say you cannot interact with the CPU, memory, disk, network calls. You cannot do any of those unless you do them in the specific way that is mediated for you by the kernel. Which means if you wanted to make an HTTP request, the kernel is actually very specific about how that has to happen. You have to create something called a socket file. You have to bind to that socket and tell the kernel that your messages or your process wants to receive messages for, that are delivered to that socket, at which point then your program will get that information as it happens. So when you build like a server or something like that, your server is going to the kernel and trying to play nice with it and saying like, hey, can I get access to port 8080? That'd be cool, bruh. And the kernel's like, hey man, I don't just give people whatever they want. Somebody's using port 8080, right? If you have, let's say, maybe one of you have run up against this, you try to run a Python web server, and it fails saying that the connection was refused or that the address is taken. Maybe this has come up. So what that is actually, what's actually happening there is you are running a program that is several levels of abstractions up from making a network call, but when it goes and uses its lower level libraries to try to talk to the kernel through system calls, the system calls are being rejected for various reasons because the kernel is responding to those system calls from those processes saying, hey, these resources are being used. The kernel is protecting one process from another. So the kernel has to be, kind of, oh, like, has to be able to be platform agnostic as well? Like, so how, Ideally. How do the, is it extensibility that gives it that ability to go on like my, like my Mac versus some Dell machine versus some other... Yes. So earlier we talked about processor specifics, which is at the heart of your question. So if you ever look at the Linux kernel source code, which we can, you will notice that there's actually a lot of really weird specific stuff going on in there. Because there are a lot of very specific processors out there. And at some point, someone has to know how to talk to the processor. And that's the big, that's the big role of where the kernel is. And so some people will mix very often what they say is the responsibility of the kernel and the OS because they're always bundled together. The OS, is like, the OS is like the set of tooling that exists on top of the mechanisms provided by the kernel. And so the mo one of the most common kernels happens to be the Linux kernel. So we'll look inside here. I hope I remember, like, uh, we'll look at an example. Inside of the architecture folder, if you open up the Linux source code and you go to the Arch folder, you can see here some things that, you may, that may look familiar to you. Like ARM architecture, if any of you are into Android hacking or have ever looked up things about the ARM chipset, which most cellular phones use. Uh, that is there. Here's another one. There's a pretty cool startup called RISC-V that is developing open an open source instruction set architecture so that there are, are, there are really cool things that they're working on. And so there's some information on how the Linux kernel can interact with that processor. Here's ARM64, right, for uh, ARM processors, Spark. Most interestingly to 90% of the world is x86. So if you go inside of x86, you'll see basically this is how the Linux kernel supports the x86 instruction set architecture. And then you can go inside of here and see even further things like boots, uh, boots, like the boot process as defined by, uh, as defined in x86. And I don't want to go too far into this because it will be a wild journey as I'm sure you can tell. But it's actually kind of worth reading, uh, reading a little bit about because you'll see some funky things about x86, especially if you go on to, where was it? I opened it up a while ago. 
There it is. Yeah, so if you read this article about multi-boot headers, you will see that there's some pretty fascinating things that happen in the boot process in an x86 operating system, like the magic number that has to be defined at the beginning of your multi-boot header. Otherwise, Grub won't know how to boot your operating system when you boot it, which is wild. So you should definitely read this. Uh, I will try to get to it in the next seven minutes. Whatever. So uh, to bring us back here to this guy, the basic answer to your question is the Linux kernel defines the mechanisms and then defines the interaction with every single hardware platform ever created. This is why Stallman hates Linux so much, by the way, because there are proprietary drivers that will be distributed with certain hardware devices. For example, NVIDIA does not always publicly publish its drivers. You cannot download the source code to an NVIDIA graphics card. You can't do it. Why would they give it away? Makes sense, I guess. Similarly with Intel, they publish binary blobs which is to say they publish a compiled object file that you can include in your kernel that knows how to talk to an Intel processor, but it will not give you an understanding as to how the processor works internally. Another thing that's worth bringing up because it's kind of a fun historical fact, we talked a little bit about x86. x86 is now the most popular instruction set architecture. Intel actually tried to save us from this a little while ago because I, uh, x86 has some interesting limitations, such as the maximum size of an assembly word, things like that. Like if you've ever heard of an, a 64-bit operating system versus a 32-bit operating system, that notion is almost entirely defined by the size of an integer on that operating system. Because integers are the most critical part of any computing resource, at, it, at the heart of them anyway. So an, a 64-bit operating system is one in which every integer is 64 bits because the boot process has enabled that particular machine to behave in such a way. You can see more about that in this article where they basically say that we're going to define something called a quad word in assembly and say that every quad word is going to actually be eight or sorry, four assembly, uh, four assembly bytes stitched together and that will give us our uh, 64 bits. Something like that. I don't remember it exactly off the top of my head. But yeah, so Linux, the kernel, provides the protection mechanisms and export mechanisms to interact with any piece of hardware that Linux supports. And so you can actually go and Google it. Hey, here's every single operating system Linux supports, every single platform Linux supports, etc. And so you will be able to run, in principle, you'll be able to run the Linux kernel on any device that it supports, assuming the chipsets are included in that architecture folder and there's another uh, lib folder that we could dig into if you're super interested as well. So the operating system is basically a means of using the mechanisms provided by the kernel to create, uh, to create value for the definition of user level processes. One of the big things I've been doing all semester, uh, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, uh, I am a teaching assistant for graduate information security at Georgia Tech for master's students. I'm in grad school for my master's in computer science, and uh, we talk a lot about these kinds of concepts, and I'm taking advanced operating systems this semester, which is the second OS course in the track, which is a nightmare. And so all we've been talking about are different systems that have been built for enabling user-level processes to do more in the most efficient ways. Because there are some really fascinating problems that come up when you start building OSs that have certain features and abilities and the hardware ends up changing underneath you. One of the, one of the distinctions I made earlier was that there is a notion of a uniprocessor on something like the IBM 6060. But we now have a much different scheme of shared memory multiprocessors where to save time, they will take multiple cores where a core is what you have been calling a processor in your computer architecture class. A core is something that can run the CPU instructions that we talked about. But if you want to speed up your computation, why not add more cores and have those cores share information relevant to the process scheduled on that processor? I could get deeper into that if you like, but when you, uh, I, in short, when you, have, when you have things like multiple cores, it starts creating complexity for other concepts within the operating system in the kernel that resulted in a lot of systems research papers being published in the 90s for people coming up with the fastest ways to architect things like web servers, things like, things like shared memory, 
things like inter-process communication resources like message queues that you guys should definitely look up. There are other really interesting problems that would come up when people wanted to start, uh, when people started doing this nonsense with multiprocessors. The second you had multiple processors, each with multiple cores, each of those processors had to do things that was strange if those two processors was sharing a resource and one of them wrote to that resource but it had it in a cache, the other one had to get that change somehow and there's a lot of really interesting things that go on uh, if one processor needs to find out about what its neighbor is doing. That can end up wasting a lot of time and causing a lot of bus traffic. So if you Google operating systems research in the 90s, it'll be the only time that Sun Microsystems was ever cool. So yeah. So the operating system basically gives you like, the operating system is in fact the difference between a Mac OS or a SUSE or an Ubuntu, right? Where a lot of these operating systems are built off of what are called Unix-like operating systems, derivatives of the original, uh, the original Unix being built out of AT&T that has similar semantics but different internals, whether that is a different kernel or a different set of utilities that the operating systems use. Is this all making sense? Cool, great. So I mean, that's basically the, uh, the, top of the, the top of the hierarchy with respect to normal user processes. There's, once you get up to user space, you compile a program within the operating system. You run the compiler. The compiler knows what OS you're running on. It compiles your program for, in the case of C, for your operating system and your architecture, 64 or 32-bit. You've all heard of that right? You get your, pro your programs and you can run them in user space as either Chrome or Firefox or 111. So what some of you guys have probably thought about, or uh, one of you touched on, I don't remember who, uh, was what happens if I, what happens if I want to share my programs with somebody else and I'm not running the same operating system? That is where VMware comes in. VMware was a company started by a really awesome dude in the 90s who <laughs> realized that if I had a binary that was compiled for one machine, I could do things to get it to run on another machine if I write a layer of abstraction in between the binary and the actual machine, right? I could write a user level process that would exist inside of user space, but instead of being exactly in user space, it's going to create a false narrative to a process. It will exist in user space, but it will create something called a hypervisor. And we can draw like a larger box here and just write user space there. So VMware was one of many hypervisors that, come out, that came out in the late 90s. My personal favorite being the uh, pre, what I guess you could call as a precursor to Docker called Cellular Disco which was awesome. So the hypervisor says, normally processes need to know all of this when they are compiled and created. And when you compile your process, you can only run it on that one operating system, but you can only have one operating system on a given machine. So as opposed to dual booting, one of the things this guy started doing was, let me take the compiled binaries and look for the instructions as they come and emulate the CPU let me create my own array of zeros and ones in software that emulates the memory layout, emulates the CPU, and then receives the instructions. I'll take those moves, those compares, et cetera, and I will apply them to my virtual CPU and my virtual memory, not to be confused with the virtual memory that exists at the OS level, but that's a problem for your operating systems professors to cover because I have a life. You're, you will have these virtualized resources that will exist within here for a particular virtualized operating system. So you could run Ubuntu inside of Windows by translating the problematic instructions that weren't supported on the operating system you were actually running on, the host, and you could run them on the guest, right? You could say, here's my CPU, here's my memory, and this is only going to exist for this machine inside of user space. Now, what you can imagine is that once, like we were describing before with Python and Ruby, those languages are implemented at five levels of abstraction up from direct electrical manipulation, which means that they're a lot slower. A similar paradigm happens here. 
where Ubuntu is going to be super slow if it's running inside of Mac OS on top of a hypervisor called VMware. Yeah. You also want to go over Docker and how it makes it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the next step on the that's the next step on the gravy train. Uh, that leads to hey. So um, I understand when you say like you use VMware to kind of like have your virtual CPU and memory and stuff, but do you not need to use like the memory and CPU like all the way down there? You do. Okay. So then exactly. is that an issue? Like how does how is that different than like I guess dual booting, which also uses resources? So you, this is a good question. It, it could touch on something else that I also didn't, for some, I, this didn't hit me until like three years into college. Uh, so when you have your memory inside of your computer, not all of it is always writable, right? There is a certain portion of your random access memory. I don't know where I can draw this. I'll, ri I'll write it down here. Hopefully you guys can see it. There's a notion of random access memory, right? It's useful because you can access it in any position at any time. So you can put things there wherever you want using system calls. There at the beginning of this, though, is a secretive sliver known as read-only memory. And this is where we get to the heart of the difference that you're describing. Read-only memory is a specific part of memory identified. And different, people, different uh, companies and systems do this differently. It is basically a section of memory that can only be read. And if you want to write to it, if you've ever done any custom ROM stuff with Android, what you do when you install a new operating system like CyanogenMod or something like that, I think they call themselves legendary OS now, whatever. So you actually have, you cannot just download it and write it to a particular portion on disk. It is put into a place called read-only memory, which can only be read from. So when you start up your process, uh, when, you, when you boot up your computer, the init process is written inside of here along with the multi-boot headers for your the init process to start the bootloader and read from. So the init process is the first thing that exists on your read-only memory. The binary for the init process is the first thing there. It starts running. It reads the multi-boot headers of, in the case of Grub, if your computer uses Grub, which is one type of system for maintaining multiple operating systems on a hard disk. The problem here is that it is a lot trickier to manipulate because partitions of a uh, partitions of disk cannot be easily uh, rearranged. If any of you have ever used a program called Gparted, you know how annoying it is if you want to resize like an Ubuntu partition. I don't think it has ever worked in my life when I dual boot or have multiple installs on an OS. So it's a lot easier to build an OS and work on it and then throw it away later when you don't need it. Because the you don't have to bother with flashing to read-only memory. You don't have to reboot the machine. You don't have to worry about uh, a lot of the considerations that go into a typical OS install. And you don't have to worry about throwing the get host OS under the bus if, you, if it goes wrong, which is really, really helpful. But you're right, it is slower. So if you really wanted, if you wanted to have, say, Mac and Ubuntu run as equivalent uh, as equivalent members of society, you need to have them installed in the same way. Uh, and so this is saying Ubuntu is necessarily the lesser. <laughs> and so it will run uh, a few layers of abstractions up. And there are a lot of really interesting things that this can do to make this run faster, such as giving it, instead of system calls, it will give it hypervisor calls. Similarly to how the kernel gives the OS system calls that it can use to get access to hardware resources, the hypervisor sometimes will provide something called a hypercall so that Ubuntu can directly make network calls through the hypervisor and skip over the OS and the, and the hypervisor will hook into the kernel in one way or another. This is why sometimes when you install Docker, it'll tell you uh, Docker or VirtualBox or something like that. They might ask you to restart your computer because they have kernel extensions they want to install that will require your operating system to be reloaded with set extensions or something like that. So half of you look bored out of your minds. Is this interesting? Yeah. Useful? Cool. So I'm going to tell you all about Docker. Uh, and I think that will be like more than enough unless you guys want to hear about Stack Overflows, which are really fun. All right, great. I'll take that, sil I'll take that awkward, misconstrued silence as a yes. So.
uh, Docker, the last piece of the, the last piece of the puzzle here. Whew. So VMware is actually only one type of hypervisor with one specific idea of what a hypervisor is intended to do. Hypervisors started coming out in around 2006 is when people were writing Ratchet Magazine articles about how excited they were that you were going to be able to run multiple virtual machines on one server. And they were largely right because what ended up happening was with the ability to run multiple operating systems on one machine came increased utilization and much more usability because what people started doing was they would run multiple virtual machines containing application servers on a single physical machine, which was way more useful for the ability to multi-thread and schedule multiple different workloads at the same time. On even like you could run an entire cluster of virtual machines on one physical machine to test distributed applications. It made everything cheaper. It was all in all just wonderful, wonderful things. But now, what this, the abstraction this got you was the ability to run an operating system in the user space on top of a guest, oper uh, on top of a host operating system. What Docker gets you is a little bit more precise. What Docker says is, I don't care about the operating system. I want the ability to specify the environment for my process. So if you ever look up a typical Docker file, you'll see that they say things like, I want Python version 3.6. I want... I want you to take these folders and put them in these places in, the, in Docker's virtualized file system. And Docker will not run an operating system. It'll just run your process. So Docker is like the JVM for processes. And I think Docker became cool in 2008 or so. Since then, some really massive and awesome things have, have happened in the world of distributed systems, such as Kubernetes. Have any of you heard of that word before? Great. So Kubernetes is really awesome because it'll let you compose Docker files on a cluster of machines that are all exactly the same. We've moved from manipulating electricity to manipulating groups of processes that are already defined and distributing automatically the workloads of those processes on different machines with the no longer concept of a hypervisor, but a master that oversees a fleet of workers that it can keep in mind the state of and be aware of changes to while it is running, which is really, really powerful. And uh, with that, you get the ability to say, here is a file that says, I want to run GitLab. I want to run Ubuntu. I want three servers that run this process. And I want them to forward their traffic to this other container where Do Docker calls these isolated processes containers instead of uh, virtual machines. But container here really just means isolated environment for a process where Docker protects the containers, the container processes from each other, like we were describing down here. And I can now say, hey, I, here is a Helm chart, where Helm chart is just a file that defines what I was just describing. It says, hey, I want to run GitLab. I want to run Nginx. I want to run these other web servers. I want to run this database. Here's the file. Here's how they should be able to talk to each other. D deploy it. And Kubernetes will just figure it out. Kubernetes knows who its workers are. And it will talk to the workers, download all of the binaries and code that it needs to run each Docker file in its own isolated environment, and then export that Docker file to a particular machine, and then give the files to the machine. The machine will install the container and run it. And then the Kubernetes master will, will adjust the networking to make sure that whichever worker got, whichever worker out of 20 got the GitLab server, you need to be able to talk to the Postgres server over there. And that is where we are today. You can now, without too much trouble, spin up an entire cluster of virtual machines just by writing a single file on your computer and then hitting the big green button which is pretty cool. Any questions? Do you want more background on a lot of these tools? I've sort of given you a lot of names, and I think the best way to like understand all of this is I'm going to write all these out in that, in that file over there, and I want you guys to just take those and Google every single term on there that you've never seen before and try to get an understanding of how we get from manipulating electricity with x86 to manipulating clusters of virtual machines with Kubernetes. If you have an understanding of that, and you are principled in your understanding of that, you will be a much, much better programmer.
because you will understand what levels of abstraction the computer is giving you such that you can use them and manipulate them effectively. So any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you very much, guys. I hope this was helpful.